<laughs> All right. Um, you're welcome. Hey. Oh, hi. We're recording now. I've yeah. got to be um, professional. No, I'm joking. No, no, no. no. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything that would beat the rhythm we already have. Um, so I'll just say, introduce yourself, your name, what you do, and where you are. Okay, so my, my government name, my full name is Chinwe Pamela Unajuba. Well, actually, it's Pamela Chinwe, but I always go by Chinwe Pamela. Anyway, that's my name, and uh, my DJ name is Juba. So I DJ, uh, I currently live in Berlin, um, but I was born in London, raised in Essex, obviously of Nigerian descent. So yeah, that's my kind of background. I'm kind of in the music world, DJing. I was working at a record label, not anymore. Uh, I'm into documentaries as well, so I like recording, making documentaries, mainly around kind of social issues based around music. But yeah, that's kind of me, I'd say. Yeah. In a bit of a show. So you said born in London. Yeah, I was born in London. <laughs> East London. I, like, that's crazy. East London. Where did you think okay. I was born? I don't know. Yeah. But my accent, where do you think my accent's from? Like, but, the, the thing is, I don't, I don't make those assumptions. Yeah, fair enough. And just because yeah. I have any, yeah. yeah. I don't make those assumptions. And, and it, but it's also nice to see. So you're born in London mm. and you, you, grew, you grew up in East London, right? So I was born in East London and I kind of spent the first, say, 12 years of my life in East London. And then I moved to Essex. So Essex is like a kind of, it's like a suburb outside London. Yeah. Um, and when I moved there, it was like BNP is uh, the British National Party. So it's like a racist kind of like right wing party that wants, yeah, <laughs> wants the UK to be full of indigenous people, even though there's like 0.1% indigenous people in the UK anyway, whatever that means there. Um, so kind of moving there was quite, you know, there was like a racist pub down the road. You'd be walking home from school and like someone would throw eggs at you and call you the N word. So it was quite an experience moving there, but it's, it's kind of um, diversified now. So the races have to be a bit more quiet. But yeah, so that's just outside London, um, but kind of within the same vicinity. Yeah, you, you know, because um, the, the conversation on race, um, mm. especially when it comes to um, black people and white people, um, yeah. I think largely is really centered on the black American experience. And a lot of people, when, when they start hearing experiences from like the UK and other parts of Europe and they're like, oh, does that happen there also? You yeah. Know? And it's, it's like, what do you think? Do you, do, okay, so my question, can you remember your first um, racial experience? Racist experience? My first racial experience I guess the first, even in hindsight, think about the first race experience, like going to primary school. Um, so, you know, in my primary school was quite a, in th that area, when I was there, it was like in East London. So it was actually quite a diverse area, but there was still kind of like, um, not to demonize them, but like a kind of white working class that was very kind of quite racist. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember in school, you know, like having kids calling you so the p i'm not going to say it but it's the p word which is like the word that's actually used for asian people which is the racist word for asian people so people would call me that sometimes in school and it's like okay but i'm not asian but it was kind of understood as a generic like racist yeah. word so actually growing up i got called the p word more times than the n word um and that was kind of like in the playground but it's weird because when you're like five years old and being called the p word by another five-year-old um it's very clear that none of you kind of understand what it means <laughs> Um, but, you know, clearly that person heard it from their parents and they kind of associated it with, like, people who weren't white. So that was, like, the kind of first experiences you have in the UK or, like, growing up in East London as a black kid. Um, but I guess um, first real encounters of, like, it being in you know, indiscriminately or, or, like, yeah, indisputably racist and me understanding it. I'd probably say when I moved to Essex, actually... Um, and when I moved to that kind of racist area, and um, that's, you know, that's like when you were twelve, right? Yeah, that was kind of like thirteen, twelve, thirteen, and so you know, walking down the road and having people, you know, be like, "Go back to your country," or like, 
calling you a gorilla or a monkey or throwing eggs at you. That, I guess that was like, yeah, 13, 12. But it's also interesting because, you know, as a 13 or 12 year old, you kind of understand that it's mean, but it doesn't have that kind of same impact of your entire identity being like, you know, discriminated against or violated. So, um, like, can you remember the um, opposite reactions to that? Like, when did you start having that conversation? So definitely, yeah. let's say you start experiencing that, you know, sure, indirectly sure. and directly from five to like 15, when mm. did you start having a conversation with people you trust? Ha, huh. it's so weird because it's so weird, like growing up, kind of understanding that something is based upon your race, but not having the language or the kind of the, the sort of yeah. the unsettling ideologies behind things to have these discussions. So, you know, I remember when I was 18 and I was in a park with my friend um, and then this girl who was like a white girl in my school was like, you're black. <laughs> and that was like her insult. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah. But she said it in a, in a disparaging manner. Yeah. So we could fight. <laughs> and then going home from school, like me and my friend who's Ugandan, we were like, oh, that's stupid, like, you know, racist, whatever. But we still didn't get it. I think it was actually kind of, I'd say my second year of university. That's when I started becoming aware of like racism more as, as a construct and like the kind of layers underneath racism, white supremacy, um, you know, kind of colorism, all that kind of stuff. Because also growing up in London as well, but you no, know, going to school in Essex, so going to an all white school, I wasn't really involved in conversations around colorism because that's much more of an internal black thing. And so being, a, you know, one of the only two white kids, black kids in a white school, you don't really understand colorism in that same way. You know, there's not like dark skin, light skin people, everyone just brown. So I think it was kind of in university when I started having those more in-depth conversations. Also, I studied history at university. And one of the modules, it was actually my first year, was called The Making of the Modern World. And it kind of spoke about how, you know, the kind of um, colonialism and slavery and the first European conquest to the, the new world and you know to the americas yeah, yeah the new world. and um how race like obviously racial prejudices had existed even before slavery and colonialism but the idea of race being this sort of inst racism being this institution that was used for a bigger you know as part of a bigger uh conspiracy in capitalism and to like undermine the black race for the say capitalism that's kind of when i realized that it was created so in my first year i was like wow so racism was actually something that was constructed to uphold white supremacy and capitalism, you know? So it was when I went to university and started studying, started studying history in more depth and talking to, you know, more black people that I, I kind of got into it. And also I joined the African Caribbean Society in my university. So that was ACS. And as I say, growing up in a very, very white area and having like maybe literally in a year of 180 people, there were maybe 10 kids of ethnic minorities and three of them were black. So going from literally having like three black friends and seeing my uh, black cousins every now and then, going to a university that still had a minority black population, but a bigger one, that's when I started getting involved in those conversations more. So oh, basically university. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it, it's, it's funny how your parents, are they, are they first generation, second? For, as in, they, they migrated to the UK from Nigeria, so they're first yeah. generation. Yeah. So Is it first generation? First generation, yeah. Yeah. So it's funny how a lot of um, kids from first generation settlers, even even like third, mm. don't have that conversation at home. Because it's, yeah. it's like the parents still don't even understand how yeah. like, the, the words to use, like you said, the words to use for it, the references. It's just like... It's, yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, you, you go. It's just interesting because I'm actually my friend, she's a journalist and she's making this documentary talking about the black experience in the UK. And one of the sections is, you know, the first time a parent sits down and has a conversation about racism with their children. And I was like, I, I can't relate to that because I never had that conversation. Yeah. You know, especially with Nigeria. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to talk too much about race in Nigeria because I've never lived there. But one thing I do recognize when I move to the, when I go to Nigeria, everyone's black obviously so you kind of go from being a black person in like a white majority european country to just being a person in nigeria and the, the things that people kind of like care most about in terms of your ethnicity are more like your ethnic group so are you Igbo, are you Yoruba, are you house are you like you know Ijo, or whatever it is um but they don't necessarily care about your color so i think and also my parents kind of grew up in the kind of shadow of colonialism uh, but they did grow up in a black country so I 
I, I, I just feel like racism and race wasn't something that they kind of grew up having the language to understand in the same way as like black, sorry? Yeah, no, 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 finish, because okay. I, I think that's interesting. Okay, so I don't, like, when I think about my cousins in Nigeria, like, they'd never experienced racism or overt racism. They might have, maybe if they go to Lagos and they have to work in a place and there's, like, a white man who's, like, you know, the manager in the company. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't experience it. So I think with my parents coming to the UK, they were aware that people were kind of rude, could be mean to them because of their colour. But I just don't think they had the kind of... Um, understanding of racism in this kind of complex structural social manner to be like by the way there's people who are going to like hate you because of your skin color and it's based upon like ignorance and discrimination you know and like a, a, a fake narrative that's been created about race you know because if I were to have children I guess you know the first time my child came home was like mommy someone called me the m-word or call me a monkey then I'd be able to like explain these things more um but like you know a few years ago my parents were talking about we're just in the car talking and I'm like, yeah, you know, when we moved here, when we moved to England, you know, the people, we try to be really nice to our neighbours and anytime they, they basically try to keep on calling the, um, <laughs> the immigration people on my dad because they assumed he wasn't allowed to be in the country and all this kind of stuff. And they really had experiences, but I guess they never really spoke to us about it. Yeah, because, because largely um, they go into that protective mode, right? Yeah. And, and even, even, in Nigeria, like it's it's like for as long as we can we can remember, parents go into this mode of I'm the provider, I'm the protector, right? Mm. And I, I feel like because they are so in like embedded in that, they do not have the emotional capacity to actually have the most important conversations in, when it comes to the children's development, right? Yeah. So they lose touch of that, right? Yeah. But also, I feel like when you're looking at racism, right, and, and race, the construct of it as, as something that was created, and, yeah. and, and you come into a country like Nigeria, and oh, obviously, oh, it's a majority black um, country. But then we do experience it, right? We experience it through different means. Like colorism is a, it's a very direct effect mm. of racism, right? Because mm. um, the white man and woman created, created a vacuum, created a space, right? That lighter people feel. So in, in society, the lighter you are, the more easy mm. it feels to navigate society. That's why Bleaching in the continent is high, right? Because people are trying to access that thing that will move them quicker. That's why people study abroad. That's a form of racism, to study, to be better placed within society, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and with all of these nuances, you see, that's why when you turn, turn, turn on your radio, you hear the accent, it's foreign. Because these people, are not speaking the yeah. way they speak on radio with their friends yeah. and family members, right? So, so it's embedded within our culture. It's just that because it's not tangible, right? Because it's not tangible, but then it, it is, right? You go, maybe when you speak to models or actors, well, or just look at Nigerian movies yeah, and, sure. and, and see how many black lead characters yeah. are, they are, you know, and, and, and you begin to question, look at billboards, you know, and see how many black women are pushing billboards and pushing ads, you see, mm. so it's, it's crazy. No, I definitely agree. I think, you know, even kind of, there were times when my mom would tell me about people picking on her when she was younger. My mom's very, like, not very, but she's like quite dark skinned. She's darker than me. Um, and she'd always like tell me about how in school, you know, uh, people would laugh at her and call her Blackie, and I never understood it because I was like, "But you're all black. Why would they be I was calling you Blackie? Blackie too?" Yeah, but I'm just like, guys, you know. But at the same time, colorism is real, and like, colorism is something like a racism that we've internalized, and we, you know, we adapted through slavery and through colonialism, whichever manner. Um, and you know, when I go to Nigeria, it's very striking when you listen to the radio, and either they are people who, like myself, like you know, a, a repat who's come to Nigeria 
used that kind of, you know, nationality accent advantage and gotten themselves a radio show or presenting show, or it's Nigerians who maybe are born and raised in Nigeria, but have perfected that kind of like, yeah, and it's just strange because you, you know, in the UK, I mean, you know, we're always camp- campaigning for like, uh, what do you call it, representation, and the UK has a tangible kind of like ethnic minority, you know, population, and still it's like a, a push to get black people on billboards. But in Nigeria, you're likely to see like a white person on the billboard, or like a really light skinned person on the billboard, when in fact the majority of the population doesn't look like that, you know. And it's um, yeah, we have we've internalized a lot of inferiority complexes, a lot of uh, racism in our own way yeah and, because, yeah. because it's, it's it's those are the evidence of trauma you know yeah those are the evidence of trauma and and, and i think sorry yeah. no you go and I, I think also with my parents i agree with what you're saying about the emotional capacity like my parent, my dad worked two jobs my mom was always working always stressed out there was very little time to have those kinds of conversations like kind of you know that were based upon sort of like your mental health or like your experiences um and you know, also my mum, you'll hear my mum and dad talking more about, you know, I don't want to say tribalism because that's such a colonial word, but like they're more in tune with inter-ethnic group um, discrimination than they are yeah. with like white and black discrimination. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious, like a lot of my conversations are centered around movement, right? Mm. And I think when we, when we, first met via uh, Zoom, we, I, I <laughs> spoke about this a, a bit. Um, and you, you're, you're someone who has been moving, you know? Mm. And, and also when you, were, when you had guidance and, and now just by yourself, you continuously move. Where did that, where did that come from? The boldness to go for you? It was quite random, I guess, because I guess, you know, in school, I didn't necessarily have like a, a wanderlust, wanderlust, the way we call it in German, uh, wanderlust. Um, but it was actually when I was applying for universities and I had never really thought of the idea of a, of a gap here or anything like that. But one of my friends was like, I'm not going straight to university this year. I'm going to go to um, Brazil. And it seemed interesting to me. So I was like, I want to go to Brazil. And so I kind of spoke to him about what he was doing. Turns out he was doing, I mean, it's funny because in, in hindsight, it was such a kind of white savior kind of moment. Like I did a gap year as an 18 year old, completely unqualified um, student. Yeah. I went to Ecuador and I taught English. I have no teaching qualifications. I have no business being in Ecuador teaching English when there's Ecuadorian teachers who would benefit more from being trained to teach English, you know, but I did that, you know, I did my gap year. And I think after that, and I, and I also wanted to improve my Spanish because part of my degree was also in Spanish. And I think um, just having that kind of traveling experience as an 18 with no responsibility, just living my freest life was just great. And, and since then, I've kind of really um, maintained the desire to continue exploring. So I went back to, I kind of tailored my course in university to ensure that I had a year abroad. So I studied in Argentina for a year. And then that involved, you know, living in Argentina, but also traveling up and down South America again, more or less, to all the countries in South America half the countries in Central America and I don't know it sounds really cliche and I don't want to kind of sound really wanky because I know that gap years and traveling are you know something that people are like oh yeah you should really do it but it's like not everyone has the resources or the time to just casually travel the world or even the kind of desires to and that's fine um, but you know just when you move around and you, you you meet different people and you explore different cultures it kind of really opens your eyes to how different people think in this world and I tried my best to have a as authentic an experience as I could, you know, um, you know, kind of like living with people who are from these countries. And yeah, I think just from the age of 18 after that, it just kind of really cemented this idea to want to continue moving and exploring and meeting different people. Like my best experiences have, have come through, you know, going to other places, living in Brazil for a while. And, but then you also, you know, there's a lot of challenges that come with it. It can be very exhausting as well. Um, also part of the reason I probably DJ now is to kind of fulfill that desire to continue moving around. Um, but yeah, I guess it was from the age of 18 and since then, I guess the rest is history. Yeah. So, um, so just, just bring it that back mm. who, within your, your parents, who decided to move? I believe my mum moved, my mum moved first to, to the, to the UK. 
um, and she was studying, I believe, um, for like a few years, and then she had met my dad already, and then he came over afterwards with her. Yeah, so what do you think you have more in common with your mom? Do I think I have more in common with my mom? With my mom? Or are you saying? What do you think you have in common with your mom? <laughs> Funnily enough, me and my mom, I feel like we're actually a lot more similar than we, we like to believe. Um, what do I have in common with my mom? My mom, I guess, from accounts of people, she's quite outgoing and gregarious, I think. And um, she's quite determined to do kind of as she pleases in a way. Um, which is funny because because I'm also like that. We had a lot of conflicts. So even when I first decided to go to uh, South America, yeah, when I first decided to go to South America, she was so against it. I mean, she, even like now that I live in Berlin, she's still like, come back home. Like it's just like, no, but I'm staying here. I'm not going back home. Um, but I think we're both quite strong, like strong-headed people. Um, and we don't tend to give up on things when we want to, like when we think they're the right way to go about things. Which, when you differ in opinions, but you have similar approaches, can be quite um, explosive. Yeah, and, and I, I think when, you, when you're looking at it from that perspective, you see how that strong-headedness and I'm living to create a better condition for myself and my family has situated her uh, in, in the UK. And this is, this is comfort. Then now you are also moving. Yeah. And it's like, it's like just the way we move um, trauma from generation to generation. We also move um, the, the DNA of wisdom, the DNA of knowledge, or even um, the, the idea of, of the pursuit for, for whatever, whether it be it happiness, whether it be it um, wealth, or whatever, whatever you find, you, you can always look back and see where those traits are coming from. Um, so so just, just looking at you now, looking at looking at your age and looking back into your parents uncles and aunties and, mm. and your family as a whole like what do you think you mean in 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 this line of movement within your family from generation to generation so let's go for as far as you can remember maybe your grandparents or great grandparents and yeah. now you because you are your they say you are your ancestors widest dream right but looking at yourself as someone who is standing on the shoulders of your parents, their parents, and just going back, mm. what you are now, and looking at yourself, you become an ancestor also for someone one day. So what do you think this means for you? Uh, as in like the movement or the kind of yeah, continuing the movement, the, the complication of who you are within your family structure? Uh, I don't know, really. I guess... Um you know, within my immediate family structure, I guess I've kind of been the one who's diverged from the the straight path more so than like my brothers. I've got two two older brothers, one younger brother. So my younger brother's yet still yet to make his fate, I guess. My older brothers, um, you know, they kind of stayed in the UK. They're both doctors. They're quite, I guess, straight down the line, which is also like great because it suits them. But for me, I guess, um, I don't know, I've kind of like gone veered off to another to branch off into another kind of world even in my career and what I want to do with myself so I, I think yeah I kind of diverged from even the past of my in my when I think about my family in Nigeria my parents they've all been quite a lot more um straight and narrow um and a lot more I guess professional whereas it might to my side I've kind of yeah taken my own fate and just I don't know wanted to run with it and and move away from uh, that the path that I guess people wanted to outline for me what do you, cool. yeah what what do you think that is what what if you if you were to look at yourself from a third party if this if if you had the ability to create an alternate reality right yeah. where um another juba is looking at you and what would you what would you say this represents <laughs> I mean, I just want to live my life. <laughs> I want to basically, we're all going to die one day, so I want to enjoy myself, do you know what I mean? I don't know, I think for me, it's like I don't even look at the things that I do too profoundly. Even when I, um, you know, started DJing, the main reason I started DJing was because I wanted to have fun. I wanted to enjoy myself because I was unemployed and unhappy. So for me, when I do these things, I just want to prioritise my own enjoyment and obviously get things out of what I do, get mental fulfilment, get, you know, emotional fulfilment, meet great people, but... 
I don't know, like, I think I grew up in a family where, you know, every single day it was like, oh, but what will so-and-so say? And, and this is like nothing unique, you know? Oh, you shouldn't be doing this because uh, so-and-so will be saying and thinking this, that and that about you. And in the village, they'll be talking about you and saying that you're not a serious person. But I just, for me, it's like everyone should just live their lives and enjoy themselves. Like we're all going to die one day. Um, so there's no point in restricting yourself and living your life for other people because they're going to die one day too. And then what's it going to be for? <laughs> we're yeah, all going to die. That's true. That's, that's, that's one of the things I, I also use. Um, but, but now looking at just me observing you, right? And just also from my personal experience, like my hair, for instance, is one of, um, one of the ways I tell society that I would not conform to mm. your standards, right? Mm. And, and sometimes you meet people who will be like, wow, I love your hair. Sometimes you meet people who will be like, nah, what's this? Yeah, and then yeah. sometimes you meet people who are just curious, like, is this good? Is this bad? I don't know, right? How do people, how do people react to you? For instance, your, your piercings are amazing, right? But then you have your head wrapped, right? Yeah. So you are many times first saying this, the, what it means to be black, what it means to be Nigerian, what it means to be black British, right? You, it, it's, mm -hmm. you, you, you're kind of saying it doesn't have a particular look because no. this is what it is. I mean, my hair, as I said before, is wrapped up because I haven't been to the barbers in four months. <laughs> so it's just a mess. <laughs> this is me just trying to look decent. Um, but I mean, yeah, like uh, people, what do people say about me? It depends, because I mean, living in Berlin, like literally every other person is tatted up, pierced up, you know, like is apparently diverts from the, diverges from the norm. But when everyone diverges from the norm, then what is the norm? Like what is diverging? Um, I think people look at me and they probably think I'm quite an eccentric person. Um, they assume I just kind of like, just do what the hell I want, which is, I guess, kind of true to an extent. Um, <laughs> Yeah, people just assume that I'm like I'm like the wild child, and I'm I do have a wild child streak, but I'm actually not. I actually can be quite you know, calcul not calculated, but I can also, I think, be quite mature <laughs> if you, you I need know, to be. You know when to be wild and when not to be. I know exactly. I know when to use my wildness to my advantage. But I think you know people, especially my family. I mean, I remember like when my grandma was alive, the way she looked at me, she looked at me like, "What is this human?" You know, like how did this human come from me? Because she just didn't get me. She didn't get it. She didn't get the piercings. You know, when I go to Nigeria, they'd be like, what rituals are you doing? It's only ritual people who like wear those piercings that you have. I'm just like, well, I guess I'm a ritual person then. Um, but yeah, I think people just tend to think that I, uh, I don't know. Um, that I'm quite, I'm just outgoing. I just do what I want, I guess. Um, which I think can is you, quite accurate. Can you, can you remember your first and last piercing? Can you remember the emotion? Well, my first, first ones were literally these ones when I was a kid, like a baby, like my mum did them for so me. So the ones that. you made yourself? Okay, so when I, was, <laughs> when I was in secondary school, so when I was like 17, my friend pierced like one, one, two, three, four. She did like five piercings in my ear in the classroom. Five? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of, what does she use? Like a, a needle, like a pin or something? Just like pierce them through. So yeah, these were the ones that I got. Um, and I've had these literally for like, God knows, like 15 years, no, like 13 so, so years. At, at 17, when you pierced it, you, you got earrings and... Yeah, what? so yeah. So I got these done, as I say, when I was, I think it was, it's like 16, 15, the blurred kind of time. And so I got like maybe, I've got seven in this ear and... I got five, six in this ear. So I got like five of them done in the, in the classroom. Um, and I went home, I try and hide my ear, but obviously it was really painful. So I was like, you know, in at home with this like headscarf on. And then my mum obviously knew what I was trying to hide. So it was very obvious. Um, so I think that kind of time was like tinged with fear because I always thought my mum would like come into my room at night and rip them out of my ears. Um, because yeah, she hated but them you, so much. But you, you got the reaction you didn't expect? I got the reaction I expected. I just braced myself for the re reaction. Oh, like okay. she hated she hated I got in so much trouble you know she also because I you know you know Doc Martens the shoes Doc Martens 
So my mum, I associated them with like goths and the devil and stuff like that. And I had like these necklaces that had snakes on them. And so, what, you know, I come home with my piercings and my necklace has got a snake on it and my Doc Martins. And like, she literally took me to the priest and was like, my daughter is like a devil worshiper. And my, my the priest was like, I have Doc Martins. It's not a big problem, you know? So she hated it. And it was just like a struggle, um, kind of just have she just you know she just complained every day but I wouldn't take them out but she just complain and complain and complain and then my dad would complain and they call my auntie my auntie would complain to me I'm just like everyone carry on complaining but I'm not taking them out and then the last one was actually this one the septum had to be done three times because they kept on getting it wrong it was oh. so painful yeah because they kept on doing it you have to get it this, it's called the sweet spot and there's a certain point in your nose yeah. where you breathe through and they kept on doing it too low. Well, it makes me feel, it makes me feel sick thinking about it. Cause I get, I'm, I'm quite squeamish, <laughs> surprisingly. Yeah. I don't like kind of like, I don't like kind of piercing stuff, but I do all the time. And yeah, so I got this one done. It was quite a long winded process because they kept on doing it wrong. So I had to keep on taking it out and like getting it repierced. Ooh, yeah. So I, I'm always curious about the intent and post, the, 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 the feeling immediately post um every event so your last piercing what was the intent i understand that you love piercing but in, in terms of making the decision that this is the next piercing and this is what it symbolizes and then after trying to do it three times and doing it the feeling after so i think i just got a bit bored like i you know wanted to do new piercings and i still had space on my face to do them I li i've liked this piercing for a very long time so you know and I thought it would suit me. So I just, you know, wanted to, to go for it. Because I, I think I had a bit of a moment where I, I shaved my hair off. And I shaved my hair off a long time before, but I shaved it, like cut, cut it even more. I dyed it pink and I was like, okay, I want to like, you know, just have a bit of fun right now. So I got this done. And I think when I finally got it done, it, obviously it was a relief because I was like, okay, it's finally been done well. And I kind of wasn't too sure if it suited me, but I ran with it, it anyway. It Thank does. you. Does. So, yeah. yeah. So, so... All everything we've been talking about for me represents movement, right? Because mm -hmm. some, a lot of the time when people hear movement, they think you have literally have to mm -hmm. move somewhere. But I feel like the movement of the body, adding, removing, uh, um, making decisions, staying still, thinking, all of this are, are movements for me, right? Because they, they, eat, they would always um, create a new reality, right? Mm. So, so it, it's, it's something that I'm really, really curious about. But then, why Berlin? Why Berlin? I think, um, for in, in a kind of pra pragmatic sense, um, I studied German in school. I wanted to move to Germany to improve my German. Berlin is the worst place to improve your German because everyone speaks in English, but, you know, I've been to Berlin a few times and it just seemed like a cool place, a fun place. Like I wanted to just live my independent free life as much as I could. Like I've been living in my parents' house um, and been cooped up there kind of looking for jobs. So I just wanted to be able to just do what I wanted and like live as freely as possible. And you have certain places that have a reputation for being really free and expressive places. Berlin is one of them. And also as a DJ, it's, it's a kind of a bit of a mecca in Europe for DJs and producers. So I thought strategically it would make most sense to move to somewhere like Germany where I have a grasp of the language um, and I'm in a city which is like full of creators, full of music people um, and there's a space to grow in my craft. Okay, so that's the reason. So now how long have you been in, how long have you stayed there? Like two and a half years now. So what's, what's making you now, this, when you wake up, what makes you decide to stay? Because I'm tired. It's a, long, it's a long process to set in a new country. Let me tell you that. I don't have the energy to leave. <laughs> Actually, honestly, I have not got the energy to leave. I am tired. And also, I, for me, I find like bureaucracy and paperwork and I, it's like painful doing it so much. Like adulting is hard, man. Like I'm just not a good adult. Like having to like pay bills and make sure you're registered. It, it really is stressful. So the idea of doing that again anytime soon, ugh. but I mean, Berlin is an interesting place because it's not the utopia I thought it would be. Yeah. There's a lot of struggles, you know, in place. Like the racism is crazy. The ignorance can be really crazy. It can be very frustrating. And it's like, at least in, even in Essex now, you know, after all these years, um, you're able to be invisible as a black, per a black woman. 
in Berlin, it's very hard to be invisible as a black woman. And I don't always want attention. And especially when the attention is like misogynistic or racist, you know. So it's not like the, per, you know, the, the, the utopia to come to. However, there's, there is a freedom here. There's space for creativity. Um, and I've created a nice life for myself. You know, there's a, a nice kind of little world of music and creativity that I'm part of. Um, and I think it's just in terms of um, just opportunities to grow and to do what you want. Somewhere like Berlin offers more opportunities than somewhere like London, ironically. London is like very commercial, very, very capitalist in a sense that it can be quite suffocating for people who are trying to like, you know, grow and, and create their own ideas. Yeah. Whereas Berlin still has space for that. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not going to lie to you. Like I really, I'm almost like, oh, I want to go somewhere else now. But I think I'm going to start just sort of uh, traveling between countries. So my base is here, but I might go and see what it's like in Lisbon for a month or Paris for a month, just, you know. Travel around. So, so anywhere outside of the UK, London. Mhm. Mm oh, what is in? Well, say, ask the question in again. In terms of your next, your next interest. My next interest would probably be be someone like Lisbon, because okay. I really want to live in a place that has like a very notable body of nature. So, like Lisbon has like the ocean, has the coast. Yeah, ocean. So, yeah. Yeah, so if it's not an ocean, I want to be like in a, in a place that's full of mountains or like, you know, lakes or just like, I really want to be around nature more because, I mean, I'm a city girl. I love cities, but I think there's something about being surrounded by nature and like having that uh, connection yeah. with the natural world. That's really beautiful. And I crave a bit more, but probably Lisbon. Uh, if not, I would like to try and visit Paris. I think I will stay in Europe because it's logis it logistically makes sense. Um, but I mean, one day, I mean, if I could like live in Rio de Janeiro or Buenos Aires again, I'd be so happy. But, yeah. you know, sometimes I'm just like, oh, will I ever settle down in one place? I might just carry on like moving between different places. But it does get harder because as boring as it sounds, as you get older, there's different considerations. Like it's one thing traveling freely when you're 21. But when you're like 29 and you're like, mm, I might want to have a family one day or I might want to try and, you know, I want to work towards something. And you realize a lot of the time that you need to kind of build roots and maintain and nourish those roots in order to establish something. Yeah. And we still live in a world where it can be quite tied to where you are. Yeah. So there's those considerations. But as I say, man, I just want to enjoy my life. That's what I want to do. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll end on that note, on the note of the idea of setting, what that is, you know? Um, do, you, do you think, do you think, huh? Because that really depends on if you settle, where you settle, who you mm. settle with. Um, sure. Because I was going to ask, do you believe that you would transition into um, a life of uh, a life that sees you rooted in a particular place in, in yeah. terms of looking at retirement, looking at growing into retirement yeah i think it's a hard one because i'm inherently selfish self like you know i'm single <laughs> i travel a lot you know, i don't think about anyone else it's just literally me um and so i enjoy that but then i also realize that you know with life you, you go through different stages and i'm loving my freedom now but when i hit 70 or 60 if i hit touch wood you know if i get to that age um, my priorities might be slightly different. I might, you know, desire other things and the things I would desire by then would have had to be established, you know, beforehand, like decades before. So I would definitely like to sort of, I would like to have a family or, <laughs> I'm like, oh, but, no, I would, I would, because ultimately, you know, I do love the idea of like a continuation. I do look at my niece and nephew and I think it's just wonderful that, you know, my, my brother and his wife created this, like these two hu human beings who are like uh, an embodiment of them. But whether it's my own children or like adopting children or whatever it is, I do want that. But then you have to think about other people. And I wouldn't want a situation where like, I just wanted to, I basically had children, but wanted to have kids and act like I didn't have kids. And then you just end up having these kids who are confused and frustrated and rebel because they feel neglected by their mom who threw them into boarding school and traveled all the time. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of do want to. Um, but the, I, I just feel like I've got so many things that I want to do, so many places that I want to go to, and they kind of coincide with the fact that we don't live forever and that, you know, we're not immortal. Yeah. Um, and like, if I could have like a 400 year lifespan, that'd be amazing. But unfortunately, 
you know, at its maximum, maybe I can hit hit a hundred, <laughs> but um, if I'm lucky. So yeah, I do want to settle, but I would have to. I first, I'd have to meet someone who was equally as like unrooted, if you get what I mean. Yeah. So someone who didn't yeah. feel too tied to any place. So they, but then as I say when you have kids and if you want to have a family, you have to consider their stability as well. I do think there's something to be said about children having stability. I know friends who've moved to a different country every two years in their lives and it just impacts them. So basically I'm trying to like delay it as much as I can. <laughs> yeah. Um, because yeah, I, you know, I look, I look at old age and I think about, you know, and even cause I live by myself, I do think about loneliness and, you know, being isolated a lot. And as much as I love my own space, you know, I'm a, I'm a social human, but like we're animals, we're social creatures. And I think a lot of us do require that human contact and connection. So yeah, I guess I'd have to concede to <laughs> settling well, down one day. Well, well, you don't necessarily have to because you can, you can be one of those who set a new um, perspective in terms of just how to live. You know? I think for me, it's not, I don't feel any social pressure. So like, it's not about my duty as a woman or an evil woman or whatever it is, a Nigerian woman, a British woman to like have a family and fulfill that societal expectation. Yeah. Cause I, cause for me, the main, the main thing is companionship. It's like, I think, I think loneliness is an issue. Okay. And it's great when you are, you know, young and in your, in your fun life and you've got all these like people around you, but also, because we live in societies, other people, they go and have their own families and they go and settle down as well. And then you realise your circle gets smaller and you don't want a situation where you look around in 10 years' time and you just suddenly, your circle's all preoccupied and you're not with them. And, but then again, you know, we can also change how we look at having families and settling down because, to me, if I was to have a family, I would like to think that I wouldn't like, let go of my entire life and my entire social life just to be a mum. Like, I think it's important to maintain the balance. But, you know, life happens and... and um, as you get older, there's just, I think there can be less opportunities to, I guess, uh, build that social circle. But once again, maybe that's something we can change. But I think, yeah, you know, like companionship, romantic, physical, whatever it is, emotional, it's, it's definitely a thing. So I won't begrudge the idea of like, you know, having companionship, whether that's in a partner form or child form. Yeah, I, I think we can, we can really just end it here. But I would definitely love to have um, another conversation about companionship, love, romantic, and because I feel that in itself is, is it, it's a conversation yeah. in, in itself. That would be interesting. Yeah, very, very, because I feel like our entire life, society is designed to... <laughs> prime us for that moment, yes. yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, yeah, and but, yeah, we're living in a weird time where our lifestyles and our thought processes don't necessarily fit into that the you know, kind of prescribed idea of what we should be and how we should fit into like romantic companionship or whatever. So it's a weird conflict these days. But anyway, yeah, we can have another, another conversation for another day. Yeah, definitely. So Juba, um, I always open myself to questions too. So do you have any question that... I mean, where did your interest in movement come from? Because you're very into the idea of movement. Yeah, but I as a kid, um, I always, I always use this explanation. As a kid, you know, when you have kids and there's that grown ups and say, Hey, you go, go get this for me. Hey, you go get that for me. Yeah. And, and kids go, but you see frown on their face. And some of, sometimes they're crying. I was always excited. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Always excited to go for errands, like anywhere, anytime, no matter what I'm doing. If I'm having the most fun and you say, hey, go buy this for me, I'm running, you know? So it's always, it has always been exciting. But then as, as we develop, I've always also paid attention to people just growing older mm. and, and seeing how characters change. Sure. And I, I also pay attention to going back to, you know, places I used to stay, and, and seeing how the environment has completely changed. Still seeing the houses that were there, but the new places, tag road, new trees, old trees gone, and, and all of this. It's just like, I appreciate life from um, a time lapse, you see? So, so for me, it's, it's, it's something that 
has always been, um, it's always, it has always followed me. You know, even, even like knowledge. Sometimes I remember when I was way younger, just learning something new and knowing that this is a new, this is something new. Mm. You know, like acknowledging that, oh, I, 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 I never knew this. Like I'm learning this right now. And, and seeing how that affects the next conversation or interaction, you know? And, and then when I started traveling, after traveling, you know, then I started appreciating the idea of moving from maybe one street to the next. I said, I have understanding the concept of it. Like you're supposed to move and when you move and return, there's supposed to be like an added knowledge, even if you didn't have any conversation because there's sight, there's noise. All of this has been something that I have been curious about. And eventually now I'm trying to understand how we become who we are, mm. you know, because even, even if, if a child was left alone by their parents, right? Abandoned, right? And let's say that child was raised by giants. The decision of that, those parents, the biological parents, would, have, would, would follow that child, right? Mm -hmm. The DNA would follow that child. Obviously, the child would grow up to know the giant as their parents and everything, but everything from the past affects us so much, you know, and we don't pay attention to that. And so that, that's, those are my, those yeah. are the things that just bring me back to movement. And also the body is like 70% also liquid. So we see our body so firm, but it's constantly moving, mm. right? If you just hold your breath, you see your body is constantly pulsating and, and moving and it's crazy. Try it. Yeah, you know, you feel it. You feel it. Yeah. No, it's true. It's because, you know, like if I look at myself from the 13 year old me to me, there's so many consistencies, but there's so many things that have been altered through my life experiences. Yeah. South America changed me completely, and then university changed me in another way. And even living in Berlin, all my music career has changed me. And it's, I do enjoy seeing the continuation of, you know, from A to B to C to D. Um, and I don't know, how has your concept of movement changed like since you've been, since this whole moment has happened, you know, this whole pandemic has been around? Um, one, one thing that I, I always, when, when, I ask, when I ask this question, one thing I bring up is it made me realize that I'm on the right path. Like, because sometimes no matter how, how clear you are, mm. you also, it's, it's human to doubt. Yeah. It's human to wake up and be like, hmm, am I sure? Is, is this it? The pandemic just made me feel very comfortable with myself on my yeah. path. You know, like, okay, I'm on the right path. So how can I be better? How can I be better, right? And also, it's making me understand that it's not my duty. It is not my duty to document to make society better to to you know leave my quota you know this idea of i was brought here to do this or uh, you know yeah. we are here for a reason I, I believe in all of that but this has also given me the clarity of now nah, with you without you the earth will continue the world would move right yeah do you include like that but no, when you think about movement and humans like do you kind of include the concept of like death and after life in your kind yes, of ideas? Yes, yes, because it, it's really what structures, it's one of the things that structures us as a society, right? Spirituality and religion, right? The idea of an afterlife, the idea of reincarnation, the idea of nothing happening, the idea of God, the idea of uh, karma and yeah. all of that, right? And But this is this is me. In, in my own spiritual journey, I do not... I do not, um, I do not move with any religion. I don't believe in religion, right? But I believe that we are spiritual bodies and spirituality is complex. So whatever spirituality is for you, I believe in spirituality. But I also believe that I, I do not want to spend my, my, this current life, I do not want to spend it trying to figure out what happened next. Mm, okay. Right? 
So as much as I am a spiritual student myself, trying to be aware of my intuition, aware of myself and my surrounding and the energies that I carry or the energies that I meet, I'm also very focused on the fact that this is what I have. How can I be a better armor blanks? How can I be better? How can I affect life better? How can I love myself when I go to sleep and love myself when I wake up? Those, these are my focus. It's simplifying, yeah. I'm simplifying myself. The more I become more aware, the more I'm simplifying like myself. Like I, I feel like I'm, not, I'm no longer attached to this idea of the afterlife because I feel like the afterlife distracts you from what is in front of you. Yeah. You know? So, so yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. Because see, when we were born, we we're born into this life, myself and you, born, taken away from the hospital or wherever we we're born, brought home, fed, now we are this, right? We survive. So the afterlife will take care of itself. You know, it will. So whoever is right, whoever is right, whether it's the <laughs> whether it's, uh, Buddhism, Christianity, <laughs> Islam, whether it's Ogun or Romila, Shango or Shun, like whoever is right, that's fine. We'll figure it out when we move to that. Let me point. get them. Yeah, but we yeah. can be better here. Definitely. Definitely. No, that's cool. Um, I don't know. Where, like, where's been your favorite place to go to, actually? Or the most, like, kind of impacting place that you've been to? Cuba. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because yeah. From, from, I think, 17, I, I um, discovered the, the revolution in Cuba. And I think early, I made the decision not to... Um, listening to my father or listening to a lot of um, I, perspectives on Cuba, on Fidel Castro, on Che Guevara and, and all of that. And I just told myself, I would go there myself. I would fi find, because it, 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 it just dug a very special place in me. And I was like, okay, I'm either gonna allow people um, give me the information and make me feel how I'm supposed to feel or I'm going to just hold on to this very innocent feeling and wait, you know? So eventually, um, years after, I found myself in Cuba and it, it was like pilgrimage, you know? Um, it, it was really grounding. It was re really uplifting, eye-opening. And it was also even there I realized that um, the 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 um, the uh, the price the price of a revolution is mm. is 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 something that no one can pay, you know. And I I I realized even as much as I love Fidel Castro and and the idea of the revolution and what it's about. I realized that no one man or woman should um, should impress an idea on people, you mm. know, and 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 really grounded me on on the idea of government. No matter what government is, government is never about the people, you know, and because even if it starts from 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 yeah, that sure. perspective, it never ends up being that. Right. Even no matter how good the government is, it's never about people. So yeah, it it just it really just rooted me in in I in I think the person I am right now, it it really um, made my my journey, it made me move faster into the person I am becoming daily. Yeah. Okay. How was it kind of for you as like a, a black, I mean, people are black there, but like an African man, was there a distinction between you and the Cubans or? Not, not much, but if, if it's, because we stayed, we stayed in old Havana, right? Mm. So still where the locals are and everything, we stayed in, in the homes of people, uh, but it was Airbnb 
And so we'd wake up and just walk within the city. No, we didn't stay where they were tourists and all of that, right? Sure. So, but one of the things I, I figured was, it's just like the, when you go into um, the neighborhood like that, you just yeah. realize how, you know, at, the, at, at its core, people do not care what you are, you yeah. know? When, when people can align with the same idea, which is even, let's say, poverty, when we are all poor, you know, mm. nobody really cares who you are, right? Yeah, sure. What you identify as. Because I remember seeing an aerobic in the morning, early in the morning, um, a trans person, a gay person, heterosexual, cisgenders, everybody just mixed doing aerobics. And I just looked at that, I was like, this is beautiful, right? Yeah. But then the same society where you see that, you, you begin to move around and you notice that all the jobs are held by lighter skinned people, so, right? So it's, it's, it's complicated, it's really complicated. You know, yeah. and we are looking at a country that has inspired the world, right? In terms of re revolution, consistency and resilience, you know? But then when you go into the country, you see the complications, good and bad, you know? Yes. And, and you just realize that, nah, it's, it's as humans, our true nature is to be free. But I do not believe in the collective freedom. I believe individuals can free themselves. Nobody, no group can free a people. Okay, so if you relate that to the current situation of like trying to bring down white supremacy, how do you feel? So you feel like you can free yourself personally, but as a, as a, you know, as a collective, we cannot be liberated? Okay, so, so that statement, right, is, is also very complex. So I see it as white ignorance. I, I, I'm, re, reclaiming, I'm reclaiming that word because I do not believe that there is any supreme white body, right? Of course. So white ignorance or white stupidity, whatever, however we want to put that in. So for me, this is it. They said... They, they, we, we as black people at the time were sold into slavery, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, some people were sold into slavery and, and some families left behind. But both parties experiencing that in different ways, right? And then slavery ends. The physical slavery ends. But the mental slavery remains. The psychological slavery remains, right? Yeah. So the, the journey of true freedom, it's not the physical representation disappearing. It's actually the mental, the psychological, the emotional, right? So, and that can be done by a collective. Level, it's, yeah. it's an individual journey. So it, it's, it's more metaphorical. Like, yes, I believe that black people should fight and keep fighting to physically be free. So, but the idea of true freedom is an individual thing. You can, yeah, get I, all, you can get all the basic amenities, all the water or everything. You, you can even get the government sending you money every month and you still be trapped mentally, psychologically and, and, and otherwise. Yeah, and even the idea of like bringing down white supremacy and racism, looking on a structural level or looking at police brutality or looking at, you know, equality in healthcare, giving people the vote. Ultimately, if the mentality is still the same, it doesn't matter what is done on a practical level. Yeah. You know, American, African-Americans got the vote, the British left the, you know, African countries during colonialism, but the mentality is still there. And yeah. that's why 50 years on, we're still in this situation. <laughs> yeah, and, and even look at it, we, we think, a lot, of, a lot of black people think that the freedom of black people will come from um, financial freedom. So we are yeah. creating black capitalists thinking that the more black capitalists we have, the more free we become. And that's a lie because capitalism is what created supremacy. Yeah. The idea of the ignorance that is called white supremacy today is capitalism, right? Sure. And every black person who rises up and enter into the realm of the capitalist community. It's a small community, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think in that community, they really care about numbers. They care about money and profit, 
right? So they're willing to come together, sit on the table, and fuck everybody up. Sure. Right? So would that really save us? No. And, and you can see that even in, in, in all of this protest and everything, you can see that one concurrent thing that keeps happening is, oh, these are the black business to support. Support black business, support black business. And, and the idea is materialism would not free us. Sure. Right? I think we try to work within like, I don't know, the paradigms of what we have. Like we've looked at white people and they've become rich and yeah. their wealth has enabled them to have the dominance, but they've also exploited other people. Yeah. By us becoming rich, we'll just we'll continue the exploitation maybe upon our own people. And where some of us will be rich, but we forget it we forget yeah. also that most white people are poor. Yeah. The majority of white people are poor. We forget mm-hmm. that. And yeah, and also as you say, capitalism as a system was built like it was built upon exploitation. So if we want we're just gonna enter the exploitative system and, and dish out that exploitation either to ourselves or another set of people. I don't yeah. know. So, so you, you feel me, right? <laughs> I feel you, I feel you. And as I always say, I'm like, oh, when I have all these conversations, I'm like, do you know what? We're only going to live for a short amount of time, so let's yeah, just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, just enjoy, man. Just enjoy. And, and it goes back to my statement of I am not the savior. You know, this idea, this Messiah complex. Because when we, when we do um, work that might be seen as advocacy or work that might be seen as destructive or whatever corner you find yourself, you, that can can take over you to thinking sure. that it is it is is it up to you you know and and i think that creates a messiah complex and for yeah. me personally i'm i fight that every day now it's something that i wake up to fight like yeah. no it's not it's not i'm going to move at the pace i want to move i'm not going to allow anybody or anything you know speed my pace I'm and gonna- i think we have when we create these demigods these messiah complexes we we kind of like make them seem like they're just like omnibenevolent. There's no, there's no flaws to them, which is impossible. We're humans. Yeah. And it's quite a flaw to kind of put an entire movement or the progress of the entire race upon a human being who yeah. themselves is flawed and behind closed doors is probably doing things to other human beings that aren't fair either. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> See, yeah. listen, one thing that I know from our previous conversation is that our conversations can go. I know, right? That's why I'm, I'm going to stop making comments. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. Or, that's or, one thing. And I, and I think we should. We should not go silent anymore. Like we should have this, like as often as we can. You know, not let's not have limited. like Zoom yeah. catch-ups. Yeah, we muse about the world. Yeah, that we should always just check on, uh, just check in on each other. You know, make a call and be like, oh, let's pick this topic. What do you think about this? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. What do you think about lemons? And go from there. I love lemons. Like, I, I my tea, I like it. Lemon with any type of tea that you can imagine. Tea, but I drink my tea with milk, so I don't know if it works. Ah, uh, and I'm not it, a fan it, of those. Not, it would not work. In reaction, you might not like it because the the milk would exactly. Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do. I mean, they're just refreshing. You know, with some water, lemons and sparkling water. Beautiful. Oh, I don't like sparkling water. Oh no! You need to get like, it's, like, it's like what's this? Like, like please! I love it. I was, it was forced on me because one time I was in Hungary and like all the water was sparkling water. So eventually, I just got forced to like sparkling water. And now, if you put like sparkling water with any kind of juice or any kind of like fruit, have a kick. Yeah, you know, a light kick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So try that. We'll, we'll see. All right, there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for for just doing this with me. It's, no worries. it's nice, and yeah, really grateful. No worries, man. And sorry for constantly changing the date. <laughs> no, no, it's but also that that's important to also make you understand that it we can do this however or whenever, you know. Yeah, sure. Because I feel like when when to add to the narrative or expand it or change the narrative of our we are documented. I feel the power also has to go to the guest, you know, to decide and be like, oh no, I, I can't do this today. And this is the best day for me to do it. And for me, I always just make everybody know that, listen, however, even if you change your mind, still, still, I will go with that. No worries, man. All right, then. Bye, man. Catch you later. Ciao.